Welcome. This is April 3rd, OpenZFS production user call. We have Jan, Steve, Stu, Greg, Daniel, and myself. And I would love to talk about ZFS diff. I brought this up, up briefly on the Slack channel with the developers. And I had this foggy memory about uh, using the SHA-256 and 512 strong checksums and that giving you slightly different behavior. And my understanding is that that will indeed validate the checksum rather than a very light sprinkling of metadata, as I understand it. And that will say if something has indeed truly changed in, from a data perspective. And that launched a whole bunch of comments such as, hey, there was a great talk from the 2020 Developer Summit that of fe features that were not implemented and comments like the that ZFS diff is known to be flawed and incomplete. And we started uh, briefly brainstorming. I'd love to run this by you. So like, hey, we don't have a name lookup table. Uh, hard links are a problem if stuff disappears because suddenly you have a diff between things that may not exist. And there were comments on how Apple has solved this in their APFS. So I'll just finish up the context. Years ago, I started doing Occam BSD build changes, looking for what changed genuinely. And then I found that ZFS diff was saying, hey, a whole bunch of stuff changed. And I knew that it didn't. I was playing tricks like setting the date to I don't know, 1969 and then current date and hoping that I can really force to see changes. And so in the course of that, I'm happy to experiment with the different strong checksums, but in practice in the field, and that's why I want to bring this up with you, um, I've been chasing down documents and deleted documents and other things for people. And I thought, you know, it would be sure nice to have, say, a distinction between data changes and metadata changes. And I realized you could mount your snapshot directory and do some unholy crawling of it and documenting what's there, maybe even using mTree. And I've used techniques like that to say, remove a bunch of ISO images that people had stored and I'll use the word squirreled away and we're preserving for a very long time while running out of space. So they wanted those gone. So I recreated the history based on names rather than actual stamps, but I explained the rationale and it worked for everyone involved. So. I would love to hear from all of you how you've used ZFS diff in the past, if any, and how you think it could be better. Because I just had three developers say, hey, it's not perfect, but some things might be easy to fix. Let her rip. Um, does anyone else want to go first? They're all muted. Let her rip. So I've used the uh, ZFS diff to feed into other replication or backup tools like Async or Rustic to tell them which paths to look at so that they don't have to walk a big tree of tiny files. Um, yeah. Yes, tiny files seem to be the, the bane of all operations at the POSIX level and yeah, all the classic R syncs and such, but you mentioned, was it Restic and what was the other? I don't remember all the tools I've used. I've played with Z backup, uh, with, uh, yeah, with a bunch of different tools, ta just to basically, if, depending on the use case, sure. find the modified files, uh, find out if any of the relevant files have changed to maybe skip over replications, whatever you need in a one-shot script. Yep. And it's very useful if you have, for example, uh, let's say NFS or SMB file server, and someone doesn't remember how much damage they did or doesn't know how much damage they did, but I accidentally used the file manager with a Raycon tablet and rearranged the directory structure in a 200 terabyte file system in random ways, then uh, ZFS diff can be a godsend. Just take a snapshot and find the basically subtrees to restore. Uh, agreed. And it's so easy to click, drag a file that actually came, that was kind of what got me here today. So let's explore that. And you meant you made a comment about fixing the pseudo file type. Tell us more about that. Uh, so um, no, not fixing it. It's uh, the 
from an, the output from ZFS diff has a one letter symbol to reference, for example, block devices with a B, directories with a slash, uh, doors with a little uh, uh, closing, whatever, uh, then mm -hmm. a pipe for a pipe, add for symbolic links, and so on. And then the after what go, uh, goes a path, and if a file is unlinked, uh, you don't have a valid path, but if you embedded either the inode or ZFS uh, object ID namespace as a pseudo uh, file type, um, then you could reference them like that, like say an I and then an inode number or whatever, so that you could still provide something and the consumer would just have to know that this may be a valid path, but it's really a nine out number. And that's for items that have been deleted? If you don't have a path to give, because for example, the, the file changed uh, and it, the path is lost because whatever. I don't know the exact circumstances where ZFS diff is unable to provide a path, but they do exist according to uh, folklore. I, you, I'm sure you've all seen in uh, zpool status dash v when it's like, oh no, corrupt data, and there's a whole bunch of like hex references to either missing uh, absent yep. files or metadata or other or files. Um, but that's easy to explain. For example, it could be a file which is still open uh, but unlinked. For example, a temp file oh, in slash temp. Because uh, in Unix, a file lives until uh, the reference count drops to zero, which means no directory contains it and there are no open file descriptors. So as long as there's an open file descriptor, uh, the file still exists, even if it is not referenced from any uh, directory. That's one of the things which uh, is different in other operating systems like uh, Windows. Um, and why, for example, SMB requires a workaround or sometimes user space NFS servers too to move away the file and pretend it's uh, deleted, but it still has to be reachable from user space by name. And mm -hmm. FreeBSD, uh, we recently gained the um, link at with a path descriptor and a file descriptor so that you can really say, take this. Uh, Open file and link it into this directory on the same file system under this name, but that's a privileged operation. Is that different from so, nullfs file mounting? Completely. Okay, got it. Cool. Uh, this is, the idea would be in this case, let's say you have a you have a long running process which still has a file descriptor to that file you accidentally deleted. Uh, let's say you have a running database, uh, mm -hmm. an SQLite database, and the the, the little uh, whatever web interface for something is still up, but you accidentally deleted the database, and you could use something like ptrace to get the file descriptor into your process, and then as root at least link it into the same file system again. Uh, that's a very um, esoteric. Uh, use of the link at system call uh, and link at system call you said yes link underscore at mm -hmm. okay now uh, Linux... no, uh without an underscore okay In linux you can go go through the sort of file systems yes you can and i have a story on that uh, i can give a little later where gee they could have retrieved that critical vm image but they rebooted thinking they were clear and they were Oh, well, when you reboot uh, the, bad things happened. When mm. you reboot the files, uh, get uh, truly uh, logically deleted. Correct. Because then uh, all the, the processes holding the file descriptors are closed. Correct. And there was and a then the file with a mail server related uh, to that. Yep. So that said, um, I do want to open up the floor, but Jan, from a reporting perspective, you sure know the abilities of like LibXO. Would we perhaps want that output to have choices of formatting? Yes, we want structured output. Um, I would mostly care about 
JSON because there's so much easy to use tooling to yep. uh, jury rig things. But um, ZF, the problem, for example, with ZFS is that POSIX allows arbitrary wrap inside of paths. So you can have paths containing new lines, spaces, tabs, and so on. So any line-based format can't really capture um, a path because uh, it could be a path containing, among other things, a new line and then a valid, valid secondary line in whatever line-based format you have. Yeah, the code's but, not enough. I hate to deal with new lines. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You, or uh, backspaces or other ASCII control sequences. Or what's also nice is on most file systems, you can have, uh, the, uh, you, let's say you have a UTF-8 based locale and you have a Latin one path, uh, which just happens to be an invalid uh, byte sequence so that you can't even interpret it as a, a Unicode UTF-8 string because uh, <laughs> it would violate the uh, UTF-8 encoding rules. So it can be that you can't even, for example, sort the output from find. <laughs> oh, um, let's not go too deep into that, but I do recall that being an issue with interface names. You can do the poo emoji, da, da, da. So that said, um, Steve, Greg and Stu, uh, have you used, been using ZFS diff and do you have any wish list items while we're banging this out? Um, I've not used it myself. Uh, again, just because we're using our ZFS storage as a second copy of a proprietary vendor system. So, mm -hmm. and I back up from, or to take directly from the uh, third party vendor as well. So haven't had a use case for it, but it does look very useful and interesting. Um, dare I say there haven't been any great tutorials out there on the, the great things it can do and perhaps also what it can't do, which is kind of what got this conversation started. And Dan L who's just joined, that's a summary of what we're discussing. Uh, you can also read back on the notes and I'll drop that in chat for your convenience. So, um, uh, the short answer is yes, we use it. Yes, we use it, use the diff all the time. Um, however, it is um, developed code. If you want to see it at NAB, I'm happy to show it to you. Very uh, cool. Or uh, de so, demonstrate it there. Uh, now, have you modified it or you've put something on top of it? Or what? You put something on top of it. Oh, uh, is that something that's visible also through a nifty web page or disclosable? It is, it is, it's, it's secret sauce. Okay, cool. Well, um, so that the goal of that secret sauce. Right. Yeah. Um, but I can say we do take it and JSON, JSONify the output to make it easier to manipulate in a web UI. I remember yeah. seeing a shell script years ago, which basically ran a ZFS snapshot and dev in a loop to then use rsync to do a basically a asynchronous uh, best effort re file replication to get as close to all uh, redundant ZFS storage as you can for a small amount of important files. Oh, all so right. use the snapshot as a signal for non for a non ZFS storage pool. That's interesting. Uh, to have something to diff, then feed the uh, diff output uh, into async pipe x x basically. Sorry, x x, and um, keep running that in a loop all the time. Whenever or, and I think they didn't use any throttling, so they just or maybe a one second or so. So it would just keep on trying to keep the mirror as close to the uh, elected uh, master as possible. Would it go as fine-grained as file level rsync or directory based? Because mm -hmm. a directory could be huge and if you throw rsync at it, knowing one file's change, that could take a while. 
I don't remember how much logic for directory renaming there was. I think they had a use case for a few dozen files, uh, but first could be large and you, yeah. Cool. Now, let me guess, Steve, if it had JSON output out of the gate, it would have saved you a whole bunch of <laughs> effort generating that, which... Just, okay. just like every, just like everything else that needs to get JSONified out, but heck yeah! Oh, but uh, ZFS diff at least can uh, basically uh, do C style backslash octal uh, escaping of non ASCII paths, so you can get data transparency, but you have to expand backslash uh, zero and then three digit octal numbers like C strings or double quoted show strings. Just don't uh, use the shell to unquote that because uh, if you do run it through eval and the shell, you can embed shell code in path names. Daniel, have you used ZFS diff in happiness or anger? I only use the ZFS diff um, when I'm when I'm doing a recovery, so I can see what changed. I find uh, if I want to if I want to see if I know what I want, that like a specific director, some files that, that have changed, um, then, then I'll just use find on mm -hmm. the snapshot there's because it seems to be a little, when it's targeted, it's a little bit faster than using ZFS diff if you know exactly what you're looking for. Um, I think I've mentioned the, uh, the findoid uh, program. Find oh, no, the, you did, but the do you remind suite. us. Uh... Uh, it's it's part of the Sanoid suite, yeah. and it just does it does. Uh, uh, I mean, you can you can do pretty much the same thing. It's just a it's just a find command, and uh, yeah, and and then it does that against the snapshot directory. So it gives you a nice output of the, um, you know, of, of the the changes that have occurred on specific files and how much and which snapshot and uh, across there. Um, you can you can hack that up in awk and uh, with a sure. with a one liner, but mm, uh, yeah. yeah, if you have Perl on the box, then Findoids is nice to have. Ian, which one did you link there? You've got some comments. This is an example of someone suggesting to use ZF diff, ZFS diff for deduplicating a remote backup utility because those tools uh, similar to, um, to something like ASIC, they suffer from having to scan the file systems repeatedly to find any modified files yep. uh, against the remote backups. And then if ZFS diff, if you know basically the snapshot to diff against, then you can uh, avoid having to walk the full uh, data set. Um, because you can just have ZFS diff walk the ZFS metadata inside and basically scan each subtree if there's a higher transaction number. And if not, uh, it knows that it cannot be modified. So ZFS uh, diff gets to skip over unmodified uh, subtrees in the internal ZFS data structures. Yep. And uh, that's a lot faster than having to uh, basically do a find uh, dash x on the data set and then start every file. And okay. the other use case for ZFS diff, which I haven't seen anyone implement, would be to vastly accelerate the uh, locate database rebuilding. I was about to say, you, cool, yes. You could you do the same stuff for that. And it would be also very nice if you have higher level databases, which normally rely on something like uh, I notify on Linux, uh, if the and stuff like GNOME Tracker or something to come close to uh, Mac OS or Spotify. But unlike Mac OS, which uh, has an API so that you can have a persistent uh, notification where it would basically uh, even on remote file systems, persist the reservations in a SQLite database and then tell you which subtrees to rescan. Mm -hmm. Instead, uh, on 
non-Mac OS, you're basically uh, out of luck and have to rescan everything, which is why it's so expensive. And you have to keep all the directories open on uh, FreeBSD to get KQ notifications about modifications to the directories uh, to learn about new files to potentially scan. Yeah. Um, and unless you can run everything uh, under a parent process, which has already opened a Filemon device, uh, you can't get around that in FreeBSD and Filemon isn't free from a performance point of view. So, uh, and I don't even know if it's not, if it's privileged or not, uh, maybe. Anyway, um, ZFS diff would, if with nice machine readable output, which it can already do if you use uh, the quoted path and the uh, tab only formatting without headers, and you it's already uh, machine readable. Okay. So you I... could really rewrite it. That uh, you would only have to basically rewrite the backslash zero into JSON escape sequences, put mm -hmm. a fixed little uh, wrapper on each line, and you would have a JSON output. Okay. So you could write it as a as a filter. And yeah. I'm guessing that aiming locate at a mounted snapshot directory would not be super helpful in that it would just show mm -hmm. absolutely everything ever and yeah, no. No, that's not the idea. Uh, the idea would I know, but I'm not proposing that. I'm, I'm separately asking. Which paths uh, to rescan. Okay. Or maybe even which subtrees have been renamed so that you, you don't have to look into them because you can just move subtrees if your database backend supports it. Okay. Cool. Uh, Dan L, any ZFS diff experiences to share? No, but I often thought about something like this for use by backup tools. Amen. Uh, say something like Bacula. Um, get me a list of all the files that have changed since this time. And then those are the files that you back up for an incremental or a differential backup. Um, it saves you having to scan the entire file tree. Uh, so on a SNEA call, someone mentioned the backup bit which is an old classic, I'm guessing, DOS or Veritas or something. Oh, my God. No. Yeah, I know, right? So You mean the dump or archive flag? It, it was file level for Windows environments for that purpose. Like, oh, let's at least just quickly check this flag. And if it's not, if it's set, we don't, it's already it, considered it, backed it, up, which is sound. The back, yeah, the, the backup software would toggle anything to, hey, it's been backed up. Yeah, what was what do you, what can you remind me of that? Because it, it was a bit of a flashback. It, it was it was net backup. Net backup, okay. So before Veritas bought net backup, it was that era. Okay. Uh and they were insisting it was like still pretty supported. I'm like, yeah, okay, not so sure, but yeah, um, Windows three five maybe. Okay. Era forum possibly. Oh my gosh, okay, maybe. Check uh, the change flex system yeah. call man page on FreeBSD. We still have these bits. So you can have the uh, user or um, so archive flag. And um, which manual page has those? Uh, you mentioned it just from memory, just close enough. Okay, in the oh, Those flex. Those are yes, all okay. the flags which FreeBSD knows about. Um, so the dreaded system immutable flag, yep. which always gets in the way of updates, but yes. and can potentially save you. Then you have the directly. no dump flag, which has an inverted meaning. So by default, everything gets dumped. But uh, if you have a file system, you can mark a file as no dump, which would uh, exclude it by default from. Uh, UFS dump backups. Are those POSIX-based uh, originated nope. or just FreeBSD doing its thing? 
Uh, the BSDs historically doing their thing when okay. adding a bunch of flags to represent what's there in a FAT or NTFS file system. So there are a bunch of ones which aren't truly really meaningful to FreeBSD, but they are to Windows. So things like the read only bits and so on are on a FAT file system, which okay. is the, this file is read only and not, uh, it's read only for this user. So these flags exist and are seldom used. Okay. Uh, so the Venn diagram of those features is a clear them So okay. that you can actually store them in the file instead of, or in the directory entry, instead of uh, in the, no, I think they are in the file actually, not in the directory entry. So um, yeah, I would have to admit, I don't know if they're stored in the directory entry or in the file itself. Okay. Uh, you, I guess you could try it out by using hard links, uh, modifying one hard link okay. and seeing if it affects the other. Yeah. So if we fast forward to 2024, are any of those flags super useful beyond how they're behind the scenes being used for just user access permissions and you name it? I mean, would any of you read the metadata there like, oh, this is archived. I won't worry about it. Or is that just an, a bygone era artifact? Uh, I found the um, flags like the you can undeletable also mm -hmm. so user or append only quite useful if you really want to make sure that you don't accidentally delete your what is it let's say an API token or something and can't override it. Good uh, then yeah maybe if, in that case it's a good trade off. Okay. So. Uh, anything else on this topic or move on to Daniel's question? As far as the, uh, Please. sorry, I'm late. As no, far as no the at all. Uh, oh, Windows wow. era stuff yeah. for the backup flag there. Yep. Um, I mean, the, the archive bit was supported all the way back in the FAT file system in the DOS days. Mm -hmm. So that's been there forever. Right. I think that back was the last thing that actually actively used it. Yeah, it could be. But yeah, it was it was definitely in there in the DOS. DOS, DOS CPM. DOS realm, yeah. Oh gosh. Okay. Cool. Ah, uh, good to know. Well, those using ZFS uh hopefully have nicer things. And those things can hopefully get better. We discussed JSON output, formatted output, and well, yeah, keep it coming. Uh now and later. But anything else at this time? Cool. Daniel, vNode reclamation and ZFS arc integration in FreeBSD. I do recall you touching on this. Maybe remind us and you have a Reddit. Reddit. Oh, I, I don't know what any of those words mean. Oh, okay. Um, <laughs> no, I, I mean, I guess I know what mm -hmm. all of the words mean independently. Check that Reddit thread. Um, yeah, yeah. So, so this is this is coming up um, because uh, the you know the the, the TrueNAS and PFSense projects and their the related companies are are looking at Linux, and I, I've been digging around trying to under understand the difference because you know a dream, I mean a dream network for me is is no monoculture, is no you know that I don't rely on. FreeBSD, I don't rely on Linux, mm -hmm. and I can, or I could have FreeBSD and Illumos. I want to have things portable and bulletproof, and and you know, truly, truly cattle-like servers. That's mm -hmm. my that's my dream come true system. But if there are if there are problems in FreeBSD, then I I want to understand what they are and who to pay to fix them. So, um, so that's that's something that stood out. For me, when I was looking through the um, the NetGate and uh, IX posts on the uh, sub subject, one of the uh, check one of your the links NetGate on guys. those. The Reddit one was screwy, and that's they're all valid questions. I think the age old one was the uh, uh, VM in a virtual memory subsystem and disk caching versus ARC, and like do we fork ZFS to essentially be for FreeBSD native like it was on Illumos, and obviously that wasn't attractive and never happened, but um, 
all valid points. Thank you for the new link. Let's perhaps take a look what's there. And boom. That is an actual link. And there's a sinking ship and stuff. So, <laughs> so if you scroll down a little bit, that's where the, the specific statement about long-standing problems on uh, free BSD with ARC. Now, now, maybe this is at a scale that I haven't approached. Um, I certainly have had servers crash before, but I've had a whole lot more Linux servers crash on me than, uh, than, than non. So, mm -hmm. well, maybe more Windows than anything. But, uh, but, but I, don't, I don't think I've ever seen a CPU memory eating problem with ARC. So what does it take to trigger that and how do I avoid it and or fix it? Uh, if I, my quick read on that statement is they didn't limit their arc and they bumped into, slammed into it from another end, which but, happens but that with would happen virtual with, machines. That would happen with Solaris and Linux. Exactly. Also. That's again, my read on it. So uh, in 12 or so years directly with ZFS, I haven't seen that, but hey, I'm all, I'm all ears. Well, I mean, yes and no. We're on, on the Solaris side of things. We're kind of conditioned to expect you know, this is what the default is for the max because there is a default max. Uh -huh. I think it's something like I uh, I'm drawing a blank on it right now. I think it's seven eighth of memory or one gig or something or one eighth of free memory. Free BSDs must not is be used a gig. By... Yeah, oh, free BSDs is insane. Of memory is reserved or something. Yeah, it's something like that. Okay. Uh, no, no, that makes it, so it has two limits. One, which basically makes sure that ZFS is encrypted completely on small systems, and then one that's linear to a uh, physical memory. And it picks the larger of the two. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that said, I see Jim from NetGate wrote that, and he's working on tiny routers. Can you send the link? Resources. Uh, it's it's an it's linked uh, correctly link in the doc. Direct link. Uh, oh, to it? Sure. Is that uh, part because... Oh, if he's working on tiny routers? Oh, yeah. I, I'm that, sure he yeah. slammed into things. <laughs> exactly. So, um, okay. And this doesn't happen on others? I'm not... I, yeah, I don't know which of these will give the exact... Maybe... So, so something like a little BSD-based router, you... Anyway. Unless you have, let's say, at least four gigs of memory in your system and don't really use them, I would recommend using I wouldn't ZFS. Be. I'm the biggest proponent of ZFS in the world, and I would not recommend running ZFS on your router, period. Well, why not if your router has has at least four gigs well, of spare memory uh, yeah, so that have, you can I just have, have these, the nice so. things? So on a big router, I would say go for it just because of quality of life and that to be honest, you don't really need four gigabytes to on a router for ZFS, even because uh, you're not going to have a big active file system on your router, probably, unless it does more than just routing, which will exactly. get, no, also I, give you more reasons to run ZFS. The, the, so, big, well, the, big, the biggest thing from that standpoint is if they turn logging up on a PFSense system, your art goes, goes mad. Yeah, and that if you're doing on-host logging of anything, <laughs> regardless of the platform, that's where you're going to end up having issues first before anything else blows up. It just happens. Right, and the FreeBSD the defaults are bananas, but I can't imagine this dude's using the FreeBSD defaults and thinks that it doesn't so happen in Solaris and Linux. Hmm. And and, and they, just... the FreeBSD defaults are bad. I wanna I wanna say like the I, the use case for two hundred and fifty six gig of RAM uh, system using two hundred and fifty five for ZFS is yeah, rare. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that that's yeah. just that's just the default setting. I think. Right. It is. Of course. I of course I tune it. It's just it, it is no bad. But it, it's, it's no bad. Yeah. It, but it goes back to it's just like everything else. You can get in a car that's untuned and drive. How far you drive, how well you drive. Yep. Oh, I wanted to run at Le Mans. You need a different setup than I need to go to Safeway. Yep. But the defaults should be 
reasonable out of a box. And basically on anything with more than eight gigs of RAM or so, it will use all but one, the last gig. But what that means is that it will, here's the problem. You may want, if you have that little load, because nothing else needs the memory, do you really want to categorically deny it to ZFS uh, adaptive replacement cache? Do you really want to have unallocated memory you paid for be there just because nobody asked it? If the you're if you're running in, is, if you're running a network device that is processing content going through it, yes, you want memory available, free memory available in case of a burst. And in addition, yes, no, yeah, you may you're... want to limit the queue depth on a network device because two deep queues can break any uh, loss-based uh, um, queue management. But still, um, there, there are good reasons not to let the system gobble up everything. But right. the big problem, which may, why, is why it's worse with ZFS than with UFS, which has similar behavior, is that the ARC is not as tightly integrated with the kernel memory subsystem because it's basically a foreign body in the kernel heap Correct. compared to the UFS um, buffer cache. So it means that it's slightly less responsive to uh, back pressure. Back pressure. And you can get a few, especially, and that's what happens a lot of times, is that people start out with a UFS and a ZFS file system because they only want to use ZFS for the big storage. And then they have a, a file, UFS file system, which is significantly larger than their uh, main memory. And then they wonder why the normal buffer cache, either on Linux or on FreeBSD or Solaris potentially, uh, and um, ZFS fight over this kernel uh, heap. And you get a ping pong behavior there. Whoever gets evicted this time yep. um, shrinks its cache size and then the other grass and then it happens again. And that can end up stalling the system when you have to flush dirty buffers uh, to really shrink the arc. That forces it to basically hold making progress uh, until it has flushed all of these buffers. It can be really annoying. Um, uh, use case where I ran into that was on a workstation when I wanted to start a big virtual machine. And the player was asking for eight or 16 gig of uh, memory right now to sp spin up a Beehive guest and then everything stops for 10 seconds and then yep. everything works again. Correct. And so if that was perfect, we wouldn't have jobs. So let's not pick that battle today of just but that's different from ZFS claiming that it's a V node reclamation issue. Okay. That's because the V nodes are the structures in the kernel, even in FreeBSD or Linux, which are basically the abstraction over yep. the specific yep. file system to reference a file. Okay. So if you're running out of those, aren't, I think active V nodes aren't swappable in FreeBSD. So if you keep too many of them referenced for whatever reason, you're effectively leaking kernel a heap memory, which will eventually bring down the system if it okay. keeps on happening. Uh, but I haven't, basically, my take on it is where's your PR link? Give right. me a bug report link for that, where you have at least demonstrated the symptoms. And I would really value it if from someone with that deep of a technical background, if they care enough about ZFS, if they were able to give a reproducer as well, but a reproducer may be very hard to find. Right. Well, so and to it... quote Daniel, let's see the PR, find out who to pay to fix it. So that that's a battle we can't fight here and now, especially ZFS on your router. However, let's pivot this to a previous angle on it, which was, should we have a magical auto-allocating decision-based heuristics based 
contraption that would adjust the arc dynamically. And some folks have said absolutely yes. And some have said, no, that's madness because you might just start asking it over and over to, you know, well, predict the future. So go ahead. There's a, there's, a, there's a difference in dynamically setting it at the start mm -hmm. versus dynamically setting it while it's running after 183 days. That's exactly the topic. So and well, is there my, any logical my best my best practice is I've got a script that as it's installed, it goes, how much memory do you have? How big are your disks? Okay, here are my settings. Have a nice day. Mm -hmm. And it would be perfectly safe to set the maximum arc size to CTL uh, early during startup. So you can just have an ask. You could, for example, add it to the ZFS RC.D script on FreeBSD and override the um, less than intelligent default compiled into the kernel code right now. So, you, for example, you could just say, yep, yeah, on a small system, reserve the last gigabyte, but don't go under, let's say, 300 megabytes of ARC because under that, that ZFS becomes basically unusable. And on a Big enough systems, let's say, pick a percentage of the physical memory. Okay. So that you have, you would have to plot that out on a curve and agree on what's reasonable going forward. Because yes, you can tune it for now. The problem is that all, and that's what we see. It was tuned in the like fifteen years or so ago when. It worked for what was a big ish server at the time. Mm -hmm. the, the rules kind of make sense, but the, the again, how, um, how it happened often in other projects before is that these kinds of formulas aren't, are only busy optimized for two or three points right now and aren't probably plotted out to the future yep so re-rephrase your arc doesn't know you're about to start a virtual machine that'll gobble up like 16 gigs of ram should there be communication or it's purely up to the operator and we all get to keep our jobs with something like for example bi managers it would make sense to make sure that you basically yeah you know, and we have discussed this multiple times again basically what i Think would be the most useful way is to have some kind of reservation and I think the best way would be to uh, have some kind of pseudo file in slash dev whatever oh, dash no. dev arc and then you would uh, that, truncate that file and when you, you would that's it, that's exactly. when you die you uh, drop your reservation so that the kernel garbage collects your reservation when the process holding it dies just, just like you can do reservations in ZFS, have a memory mapped. Here's my ZFS reservation that can no. fluctuate. Hold on, let him finish. That way you can fluctuate it saying, hey, I need 40%, I need 20%, I need 16%. Percentage ZFS already the... have that functionality. Let's use the it in is... ZFS's memory allocation. The problem what we have is, at least from the user Based point of view, we have a single SUSDL or pseudo file in Linux uh, sport where you can put in the arc limit in, I think, bytes. But what uh, you don't have is basically a subtract from that in such a way that it is robust in the face of failure so that you don't leak your offset, basically. Let's say I spin up a virtual machine and it crashes. I don't want that reservation to persist longer than the process on which for which I uh, created it. So hmm. I want basically it to be, I want it, the kernel to be a robust uh, reaper of those allocations. And the way to do that is file descriptors. So you have to get file descriptors. Hmm. And the easiest way to, especially in a portable project where you don't want to add a new file descriptor type to every port operating system, while it's not as neat as you would like, but I think the least bad way, which is somewhat portable, would be to go through 
device files so that you have a file descriptor uh, and a file type. So it's a character device. You would just basically do an ioctal or uh, if it's supported on character devices, a truncate, F truncate system call on the file. And just because it's this kind of character device, it's handler for the DFS operation would basically add an offset. And that could very well be inspectable via SysCTL on FreeBSD or somewhere in SysFS uh, in Linux. That's fine, but the kernel will not be able to magically um, subtract the offset again from your SysCTL if there is no object with those lifetime the kernel could have tracked. Mm. Otherwise, you would have to have a special integration in the case of Beehive between VMM devices and um, so basically the Beehive kernel device for the virtual machine and ZFS. Well, it could be argued that virtual machines are common enough special case that may be worth putting in the boilerplate into the kernel for this special case alone. There are other use cases, other applications which needs lots of memory at the same time. Let's Database say you want to run an elastic search uh, okay. node or something like that, or any other in-memory database. And hmm. there you can't have this special case. So the only portable I can think of is to do it through a character device and then hope that every operating system has a mostly sane way of implementing directories in that. And then you also have through the directory where you basically create this under slash dev, that's it, slash dev uh, arc slash something. Okay. Well, let's first uh, you understand the problem before solving it. Go ahead. Yeah. So. Create a file under dev shared memory. Here you go. There's your file. Okay, so you. Slash uh, what dim, if I don't? Dim. No, SHM. You no, know, if you do it through a SHM file on Linux, for example, or an anonymous mapping on FreeBSD, you're forced to use that mapping. Uh, your baby. What if no, I'm not, I I'm not saying that's the solution, Jan. I'm saying that is a mechanism to work around a problem that we don't know what we have yet. And the problem is that if I use a shared memory file descriptor, which exists on FreeBSD and Linux, and I suspect on Solaris, is that the memory I'm reserving is already allocated to that file descriptor. I can't then allocate it again. So basically every application has to be patched to then allocate from that backing memory I've just reserved. Hmm. Yes, absolutely. Instead of, I want to change the size of the memory available for general purpose allocation. Basically, I want to shrink the arc size maximum dynamically. And then what happens when you're shrinking the arc while you're doing a something that's actively using the arc and all of those? I get a lower hit rate and uh, things run suboptimal. Yeah, you just you just get a bunch of misses. That's not an issue, right? But it's it going can to be a performance taking... issue, but it's what not a happen? pathological one, right? But you'll you'll start taking. CPU interrupts and everything else that will degrade everything until it clears. So um, yes, I, I agree it will it will pass. It wouldn't, I, wouldn't ex I wouldn't expect that you're using this frequently. So it's not that I would expect to all the time grow and shrink the arc, but only basically doing big uh, administrative operations. Well, like step one, here's a nickel kid, buy some more RAM, machines. but um, if your use case isn't quite planned out, well, you have a problem and you will continue to have a problem. I don't know. Just... Yeah, Eventually you learn how to plan things. Hopefully. Right. Either that or you hire a hosting provider that's going to do that for you. Right. So, yeah, all of this comes back to is how far do we want to be out of our jobs? <laughs> you took the words out of my mouth. Exactly. We, we, we are wizards by definition. Yeah. And if we can't pull magic out of our hats and other locations, what's our value? Oh, great. Now we're all AI. Yeah. But that Ooh, means an AI arc manager. Oh, wait, wait. You're on the <laughs> phone. 
We can get funding. Uh, oh. Fund it. Fund it. <laughs> so That said, anything else on that topic? Because there are certain battles we will not win in this in the remaining minutes of this call. So the easy way to to get, uh, let's say, eighty plus percent of what has been argued for would yeah. be just to have a dumb little demon which persists the result in a file and makes the API wanted available via a Unix socket and you would busy when you drop your socket, your reservation and that demon then is basically the locking manager for that CCDL. So that it, it keeps track and it is trusted to keep the sum of all offsets basically. Could that be banged out in Lua and channel programs or something like that using either the ZFS mm, Lua or- Does not apply. Or... It does not apply. Okay, so how? What's so, the path to a pro proof of concept, no matter how unreliable? I found out lines of C. Well, someone has a homework assignment. Other topics. <laughs> I know you're busy, guy, but I'll put it. I'll immortalize it here. Okay. Uh, other topics. It wouldn't be clean, but it would be a proof of concept to put it in user space as a trusted demon. I would love to see that. Just saying. And because, you know, there is, there are some right answers out there for some use cases, or how about we all just keep our jobs and sit carefully watching the arc, which I'm not against. That works for me. Uh, so. If you really want to do it, you could probably go to uh, integrate it somewhere along the lines of the NUMA framework and busy create your own little memory pool, which you get to first, uh, or any process in whatever inheritance hierarchy gets tracked, would then get first call on that memory from the reservation or something. But uh, it's, yeah, good oh, luck. Now that, now that, that, that sounds like a Solaris 2.5 memory mapping. Yeah. <laughs> if I remember right. It, so, Hmm. That, that that's a huge digression. You can purge that from the record. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um and it sounds a lot more helpful than a AI rant. <laughs> <laughs> uh one just little thought to throw out there. The moment you start swapping is a nice warning that you're doing something wrong and that may want to uh, trigger behavior that is not yet defined. Like, hey, red, red alert. <laughs> Just saying. It depends on your use case. A yeah. few yeah. kilobytes here and there may not be a problem if you have a few max of swap, which eventually uh, get allocated after weeks of uptime. And I've seen systems which were perfectly responsive, swapping more than 500 megabytes a second continuously. Interesting. And, and just chug, chugging along, it helps when you have uh, obtained memory. But uh, the system was just busy. Happily loaded, the CPU was busy, the network was busy, and was swapping like crazy. Uh, it can happen, but it takes a workload that can tolerate the latency. And it's really uh, unusual that you find a system which is swapping hundreds of megabytes a second and still doing anything useful. Yep. Okay, so that said, uh, anything else at this time? We're just about at an hour. Any wish list items, ideas, concerns, PRs to look at? Do keep thinking about all those because the problem isn't going away, but we also don't want our jobs to go away. So it's a, it's a balance. It's a balance. If anybody feels like going to NAB, I've got tickets. Oh, that's actually you, a great one. You uh, reach out to Stu for NAB tickets. Uh, what was that date again? Please remind us. Or uh, starts on the 14th of April. 
That is it soon. Runs through Wednesday the where's my calendar? The uh, 17th. And those are entrance tickets or airplane tickets? <laughs> entrance. Ah, darn. Nice try. Yeah, I, I, yeah. Last year I just did a early flight in and late flight out, and it worked out great. My feet hurt, but that's okay. So uh, I heard a question here, which we got uh, on the Reddit page. Also, it's referring to the comment. First one. Says, oh goodness. Oh, uh, we talking uh, uh, the Register article? Maybe I'm gonna guess about these big publications that are clickbait more than honest journalism. Hmm. Oh dear. If, Ew, if you don't know, that's okay. I was wondering yeah. I want to read the backstory on that one. Uh did, did they specify the article or is it just sort of hand wavy mushy? No, I pretty much copied and pasted anything he had to say on it there. Yeah. Um okay. sounded like it was general knowledge kind of thing. Yeah, no, I'm taking all the coverage with a grain of salt. So I that yeah, I could make statements all day and night, and some will be accurate, and some can just be right out of my backside. So anyway, <laughs> true. So we are at just about two p.m. Pacific. Does that work, or are there any final thoughts? Well, it's also worth noting for those kind of statements, I can come up with a statement list of statements as long as my arms that are not exactly false, but not really true either. Is that what they referred to as truthiness a few years back in politics? Yeah, it might be. Okay. So anyway, thank you all so, so much. Keep your ideas and PRs coming and questions. And it looks like that will be the 10th, uh, perhaps. So without any... Uh, so, go ahead, Jan. You got a topic for the official call? No, just a comment about what f got fixed because... Uh, I ran into a, a painful issue in 2018 or so uh, that um, in FreeBSD, if you had a NUMA system uh, and you had an unbalanced NUMA system, right? Uh, ZFS, and I recently found out that the fix was committed for that and I don't have to worry about it again. So basically now the swap in. So basically FreeBSD has several stages of escalating memory pressure and with an unbalanced Numa system it can happen that you that the one Numa domain will scream bloody murder um, but the system has tens of gigabytes of free memory available oh. and then uh, the arc will get uh, basically asked to shrink to accordance of the available memory. ZFS isn't truly NUMA aware and we'll just say, well, there's like 40 gigabytes of memory on the system unallocated. Why should I shrink the arc? Does okay. nothing. The NUMA domain stays uh, under severe memory pressure and FreeBSD used to then, if over time, any process which ran the NUMA domain would get paged out to the point where they were completely paged or okay. so truly swapped out and it would refuse to ever swap in a process until all NUMA domains are out of severe memory. Sounds like pressure. a bug. It no was a bug, lessons, it was just silently jokes. fixed and, okay. uh, in 2019 and so we don't have to worry about this logical corner case anymore but it truly ended up life locking the system and you could log in new processes but basically run top for a few minutes okay figure something out and save it for story back time to your show. yeah save it for story time just cut yeah. it off okay well like and subscribe cut it you all talk to you soon bye-bye <laughs> thanks michael